Hello, Ryan. Boy, on. Look at that. Oh, and a Pasha. Hello, hello. The one and only Pasha. Sorry, good. The only one. <laughs> good afternoon, gentlemen, and good morning still for those on the West. How are you guys doing over there on the other side? <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh looks like we get to enjoy our time together i'm excited that we get to have a, another linkedin live it seems like it's been a long time boy i don't know about you but like three weeks what seems it just seems much longer than our last time it's been too long it's been too long um i i think you know there's a very small population of people out there who actually list, enjoy listening to us rant about security <laughs> topics and then there's everybody else but this week we have a a very special guest uh mr pasha benison joining us uh for this presentation so hi pasha hello yeah super exciting to be here um really looking forward to identiverse it's my favorite show so kind of wait for it all year uh, it's it's pretty amazing how uh how the identiverse conference is is kind of like a i think it's our super bowl in identity right like that's the one place that we get to hang out and it is, you know, just such a tight knit community. We get to see a lot of people. I, I get to see a lot of people that I haven't uh, seen almost for a year since the last Identiverse. So I get really excited when it comes to Identiverse and, and we'll, we'll move into uh, some nice little, you know, history and, and some fun. And we got a lot of Pasha going on there. And of course we have our, our lovely Doug that has uh, taken some of the limelight in the picturing here. Um, yeah, so it's it's fascinating. Like you know, this year I think Ryan, you have two presentations at Identiverse, correct? Yeah. So, uh, congratulations to you. I hope I'm sure your presentations are completely done and you know well rehearsed by this point. <clears throat> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I agree. Uh, <laughs> rehearsals and uh, timing and everything. Uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting, and we get to talk about um, our our integration with CrowdStrike, as well as we get to talk. I, I, I'm really kind of more passionate about the the talk that I think you are also kind of giving at RSA uh, around like the value of pass keys and, and how they can actually help uh, defend against some of the degenerative AI stuff. But you know, some of the things you know from the Identiverse, we'll, we'll go into a little nostalgia. I don't, Pasha, did you go to the Identiverse that was in Torrey Pines in San Diego? I think that was like I did not know that was like eight years so back when I think what, what year was that do you remember oh pre I don't know did, did anything exist before the pandemic <laughs> well yeah identifies existed yes <laughs> I'm just trying to remember from uh what years that was I think it was like the 2015 maybe 2016. Um, yeah no I didn't go to that one um we kind of had a rule at ping where we didn't want you know this was a ping show at the time and i was working for ping and we didn't want it to be completely overwhelmingly all ping, ping, ping people so we wanted to kind of step back and not have everyone there uh because we, we wanted it to be an industry show which which it is now and i don't know what the rule is at ping now but i think when i was at ping i went to last four and then i've and i've been here for five years so that'll be my fifth one while I'm at hyper. Actually it won't be because yeah. I think I think now it's a missed. I think now it's a show for people who used to work at Ping and people <laughs> who are so. still and people who are still stuck having to keep using Ping Federate. <laughs> uh, and, and then everybody else. Um but yeah I think uh, I'm looking forward to the show. I think it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Um you know other conferences like RSA are definitely entertaining and interesting but for us identity nerds, I think we get the most value out of conferences like Identiverse. Uh, and so I'm definitely looking forward to it. And, and our topic of conversation uh, today, given that Ping was, Identiverse was traditionally a Ping conference, but now it's a much broader set of um, things. But the vast majority of, of people that come to that conference have in some way, shape or form interacted with the Ping products. Um, I believe, and today we're going to talk about how organizations can implement passwordless authentication and better security controls on top of their ping implementations. 
uh, you know, we'll talk a, a fair amount here about paying Federate in particular, because when we talk to a lot of big companies, especially, a lot of them are still running thousands of applications that are federated to ping Federate. And, you know, they are eager to modernize the authentication experience and the security in front of that. So, Ryan, if we go to the next slide. I was, uh, I was also going to note that for those select few that may have tuned in or am, is watching live, uh, by all means, if you have questions or comments, please fire them off. We, we are monitoring and, and we'll look to address anything that comes in. Uh, and, you know, moving forward, we'll go to the next one for you, Boyan, and uh, this lovely graphic work in, in illustration. Yeah, you know, I, it wouldn't be a hyper presentation without an E-minute. minute. Uh, so here we are. And, and for us, when we think about kind of the position that lots of Pink Federal customers find themselves in right now is they have this uh, they have this technology that's you know either on premise or managed by a third party for them, and they have thousands of applications federated to it. And, you know, over the last decade or two, they've built you know, seemingly countless hooks into it to get lots of customizations, to make their workflows better, to make things easier for their end users, um, data hooks and such. And, and they really now find themselves at a crossroads, right? Where they want to modernize the authentication experience for their organization and for their users. Many employees uh, complain a ton about like MFA fatigue for example, especially if they're working remotely and they don't have that single sign-on type of experience uh, when, they're, when they're working from home. Um, and, and they find themselves at this crossroads where they have to kind of figure out what they want to do. Do they move to a more modern identity provider? This could be, you know, a Ping One that's provided by Ping itself as the, as the evolution of, of what they currently have on premise. It could also be, you know, Azure or Entra Right, because uh, hey, the company has a E5 license and it's kind of free, right? But and there's a bunch of stuff that comes associated with that. Um, and then there is, you know, Okta is an obvious uh, choice as well for many organizations. And so that each of those choices have their own pluses and minuses. But the one that cannot be denied is that moving hundreds of federated or thousands of federated applications from one IDP to another uh, is a monumental task and it tends to take many years. So if your motivation is primarily to streamline the employee login experience, modernize it, have it be passwordless, having it, have it use pass keys and FIDO and all the great new standards based stuff that has come to light in the, in the recent uh, years, you know, you can get all of that value and not have to switch IDPs by using some of the stuff that we've built and that Pasha has done a great job of, of making sure that it, uh, it works at, as advertised here at Hyper. Uh, so today we have several of our largest customers here at Hyper who use our Ping Federate adapter and similar technologies to enhance that login experience, have it be pastureless, have it be phishing resistant, have it be much more secure and reduce that MFA uh, prompt fatigue all at the same time without having to think about how am I going to switch over 2000 apps, many of which have their own customizations uh, to to a new IDP. What did I miss there, Pasha? You're, you're smarter at ping stuff than I am. Yeah, I think, I think I think one thing I would add is depending on when you joined uh, the Pink Federer team, right? I mean, meaning, you know, there, were, there was one way to manage policies, you know, in 2009, and then there was a better way to do it in 2011, and then even better, you know, going forward in time. But however you started doing it, generally you're stuck with whatever way you had done it before. So when we built this integration, we wanted to make sure you wouldn't have to rework all of those policies, those policy screens, you know, that, that kind of pick your authentication journey. You know, sometimes it takes 10 minutes to load, they're so long. And, you know, just avoiding that work um, is, is saving you months of time. Yeah, and we know these days identity teams don't exactly have all the hands available 
um, or, or that they need in order to s execute on some of these identity modernization projects. And that, you know, doing this approach with Hyper is is something that significantly uh, decreases that time to value. Right, you, you you can get up and running very very quickly with this and and start using Hyper. Uh, and start getting the value of a passwordless authentication experience fast. So uh, we'll move on to talk about how this thing actually works. Unless Ryan, you of course have any comments. What I think you know, that we we have a couple things here, right? Um, one, we kind of talked more about the technical, but there's a lot of challenges too that we've seen. And I know Pasha, we were having conversations about like change is not necessarily a, the most sought after. Um, component, especially in identity, right? It's always a challenge to to invoke a major change to your end users. Right? And I think I think some of what we even see in this meme as a joke, like, yeah, okay, the, the bright shining castle on the right. Well, the one thing is, is you're not actually invoking a big infrastructure change. You're not invoking a, a large uh, end user change. It might just be, hey, here's a new authenticator. Here's a new way to do things. Um, and I think we have evidence of, too, boy, we, we've had conversations where what maybe somebody didn't make an identity purchase in like the last 18 years or 15 years, right? Like, like that's how much a, a lot of businesses aren't ready to change because of fear, right? A lot of it is too an identity where like it's working, we don't touch it. <laughs> like, and, yeah. and, and so uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Pasha and, and Boyan on that. Yeah, I think in the last 20 years, you know, everything was about an identity was about making it easier for the users to log into applications. You know, single sign-on, right? Let them use one password. Let them log in on the same screen, maybe two screens, maybe three screens, but at least use the same username and password. We weren't really focused on security as much as we were focused on just getting the users logged in. And I think that's trying starting to catch up with us now. So you know, if if somebody is able to steal a credential, well, that's the only credential they need to get into everything. So so. I mean, that's kind of the danger zone now. We didn't really have this problem. We didn't consider it. But users are kind of used to, okay, well, you know, we've been trained. This is the only place where we log in. We need to be able to um, to change it without them, you know, putting the brakes on, on the new system. Modernization is great. Once you get through it, modernization can be difficult when you when you're actually going through it. Yeah, A plus, and, and there's a lot of that. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Type of mindset, right? And and what what lots of organizations are realizing right now is, oh crap, it is broke because our users keep getting fished. They're complaining about too many MFA prompts because now they work from home instead of from the office, and they never used to get this many. So what's going on? And so, lots of businesses are now realizing, like, oh geez, it is worse than it used to be. So we got to do something, but that something doesn't have to be a three-year identity migration project. And it's it's crazy because as you were talking about, I was like, I, some of the things that Pasha was saying, it just triggers us right into the many, many years that it, like identity is cybersecurity. And, and it has been so disjointed for so long, but I don't want us to go down that ramp because that could be a whole topic on its own. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's seeing like this, this evolution and in, in the change overall with the elevation of of identity being that that security element because of phishing i mean we we could even make comments about how how much harder is it going to be to authenticate users now with you know we can say chat gpt 4.0 with seeing the phishing and translation voice translation live native language speaking like it's just going to get easier and and, and much more difficult to identify so i think we have some exciting times ahead of us and i don't want us to Go down that rabbit hole so i will move on to the next slide to keep us on point uh, and i'll go ahead and let that open for you there yeah so this is a slide of just a, a high level component diagram of how hyper works with ping and specifically ping federate it works in a very similar way with mod more modern versions of ping like the da vinci stuff that they have going on but the point of this is how can we give the user and empower them to have a better user experience. So what, what we enable them to do is to use a mobile authenticator that is FIDO certified, which is the Hyper mobile app, or a uh, authenticator like a YubiKey or a similar security key that is also FIDO certified to then access their 
a corporate environment. And we believe that once you log into your computer in a secure way using multiple factors of authentication, then you should just be able to have seamless downstream access into all your other resources, regardless of whether or not you're on the corporate network. Right? If you're if you're on a corporate network and you have your single sign-on working great, but if you're working from home and you logged in to your computer using FIDO, when you go to open a ping application, it should be seamless to log in. And, and so, you know, this requires working with Ping Federate. You know, we, we have a adapter that we provide and, and maintain. Uh, and we also use this interaction to securely authenticate the user to Active Directory. So they're a full citizen on that domain once they are logged in. And the other, you know, cool thing, which Pasha, you can also touch on more on all of this because you're better at this than I am, is actually leveraging other data and signals from other security tools you have to make that determination, right? So if you have CrowdStrike giving you a zero trust score, for example, when you're logging into your computer, it doesn't matter if the user has the right authenticator at the right time. If, that's, if, that, if that machine is infected with malware and the zero trust score is way low, maybe we, wouldn't want, we don't want them to log e to even get access to that machine. Um, so these are the types of things that we see larger organizations doing and, and wanting to do more of. Uh, feel free to comment. Yeah, and so I think that the CrowdStrike, I think, is definitely it's definitely the right you know approach here. Is if if CrowdStrike is telling us there's something wrong, maybe we shouldn't let the user in. If we feel that something is wrong, we should let CrowdStrike know so they maybe they can start doing some things inside the enterprise to limit what that login can do, or maybe you know tell us it no, it's okay. You know we understand this. This is fine. So. So certainly being able to plug in into the risk engine that has more data, right? Tr traditionally, the risk engines have just the data from their own stack. So now we're saying, let's go and gather the data from everywhere and, and let all of the risk engines communicate to each other so that we can get the best, um, the best data and the best result from that data. And then I think that it's also important that you're authenticating directly to to being federate, right? Directly to your single sign-on system. So that there is, you're not being redirected somewhere else to do your FIDO exchange. You're doing it directly with the system. So that what being federate adapter does is it actually turns ping federate into your FIDO server. So all of the pass keys are registered directly with ping. Um, the enterprise owns that key. Um, it's bound to their host name and so on. So if, if you, you know, if the enterprise at any time down the road, ten years from now, it needs to switch from from Ping Federate to something else. They still own the key. They don't need to ask all of their users to re-register. I, I think potentially um, the pass keys are going to live much longer than passwords. Now, we change our passwords every ninety days. I, I'm I'm seeing us not changing pass keys for the entire time you work for the enterprise. Why would we do that? Especially if they're if they're in a YubiKey or, or you know secured in, in, in a way where they can't be stolen. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, kind of the, this thought process of the longer that you have a password, the less you trust in it. Right? Because every day that goes by that you're using that password, the likelihood of it being intercepted or you being fished or whatever increases. Right. And, and But with a passkey, the longer you have it, the more tenured it is, the more you trust it. Right, because it's not something that can be intercepted or, uh, or, or stolen because it is phishing resistant. So it is the complete opposite of, of from a security model perspective of, of how a password operates, which is great news for the industry. Uh, and, and what we're seeing with our customers is if somebody is consistently using a, a FIDO authenticator or a passkey, and then they all of a sudden show up with a brand new passkey, well, that is a moment where we need to do further introspection and analysis because that should not happen very frequently if it does it means something something has gone wrong and that's where especially you would want to start pulling signals and data from these other security tools to you know to inform your hypothesis right and, and i always found it weird that a lot of the risk stuff that we see out there you know kind of starts after the user is already in Right, and that user can be malicious or not, right? So it's like 
somebody breaks into your house and then you start kind of thinking about like, well, you know, what can we do to get them out yeah. instead of not letting them in in the first place? Uh, you made me immediately think about squatters, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, uh, and I think that has actually been part of our, our challenge as industry and as, as even, you know, security professionals is that how do you, how do you get the good preventive without impacting the user, right? Without cutting down productivity. And I think, I think we, we keyed on it pretty well there because I remember having this conversation with Pasha years ago around the more we use a authenticator with UAF or, or any pass key, the stronger and stronger it goes as well. So that, you know, basically saying the same thing you were saying, Boyan, and, and that's a new pattern for us in the world of identity. It's a, it, it's a complete polar opposite of a pattern that we have to start looking into. And there has been, maybe I would call it a failure around the adaptive components and risk-based auth, which has been more or less letting fraud or letting the, you know, maybe it's not tuned correctly. Maybe the data is not accurate. Maybe the signals aren't, you know, high fidelity enough. Um, and things just get lost in, in the, the shuffle because the data isn't clean. And I may have stolen this quote. There was somebody had uh, said this at a, at a conference, which is, you know, part of this goes into that we had this big initiative around big data and now big data is just the normal. And we're drowning in data, but we're starved for information. And, <laughs> and I'm like, that, that was one of the greatest quotes I've, I've still, I, I'll find the individual's name and, and I'll make sure I cite him accordingly. And I'll he, give you credit for it. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's the internet. Everybody takes credit for everything. It's funny. Yeah. But that analogy is so true, especially when it comes to security and identity, right? Like you, we bring up the topic around CrowdStrike and having the zero trust score. We actually can inherently trust CrowdStrike's computation, their insights, and we can be very targeted with that. And in taking that information and returning it back to either CrowdStrike or to a, you know, a SIM or something else and giving very pinpointed a detail of letting that data be actionable, which basically means now we're actually working with information and we're not working with just data. Uh, and I think this is what kind of shepherds this alteration for identity to get us to the point where it's like, hey, the more we see a passkey, the better this is. We want to see this passkey over and over again. We want to see the same one over and over again because it strengthens over time. That's a metric that hasn't been used. I guarantee you there's nobody yeah. in our industry that has leveraged this as a metric. That's a great point. That kind of brings us to our next slide, I think, where we, we talk about the future proofing aspect of it, right? So when we when we look at organizations who are currently, let's say, using Ping Federate on premise, they have thousands of apps on it. Well, they may have Office 365 on Intra, right? Maybe they acquired their company acquired another company that's using Okta. And now they find themselves in a situation where an employee has three different MFA apps on their phone. It's painful for everybody involved, both from a usability and support perspective. Or maybe they're just an organization that has thousands of apps on Ping Federate and they're looking to move some of those to another IDP. Well, the nice part about having this decoupled approach to authentication where Hyper is doing the authentication into your IDP is as you move applications between IDPs, whichever ones you want, the user's authentication experience is consistent. And you can guarantee a phishing resistant authentication experience every single time for every single user into every single IDP. And that is something that organizations just don't have right now, right? If I'm a hacker, um, I see you're using a phishing resistant authentication into Entra, I'm going to go after a ping federate front ended application that might not be using phishing resistant authentication, right? So it, it, hackers will always go after the weakest link. And this kind of de this decoupled approach to authentication provides the most value. And just really make sure that if as you move between IDPs, your users don't have to re-enroll into anything. And I think that's from and a that change management perspective. And we're not syncing passwords between them, right? Because this is, yeah. for the longest time, has always been, OK, we're switching from this IDP to another IDP. How do we move passwords from here to there? And so I think they'll, all large enterprises have password sync servers all over the place. and of course the bad guys are happy to leverage that yeah yeah absolutely so i i think we've talked too much anyway um let's jump into a demo and uh, pasha will run that 
That, that's Boyan telling me to shut the hell up. <laughs> yeah, so I think the... Uh, uh, do uh, can yeah, yeah, that's the screen we want to see. Uh, so the, I think the first part of the demo, it, although this isn't traditional, is we want to see that you cannot get in using a traditional authentication method, right? As I was just saying, your password sync servers are everywhere. It's the easiest credential to steal because you can just put a page that looks like the right page. When the, when the employee is stressful, they type in the password, now you have it. So the first part of this is just the fact that, hey, you cannot get into your endpoint with a password. So for this user, the password doesn't actually exist. I'm typing in garbage here. And it says, I'm going to pause here. It says, well, you must have Windows Hello or smart card to sign in. These are two passwordless methods that are very secure, both rely on public key cryptography. Uh, then, of course, if you're authenticating into the Windows machine with Hyper, it's both usernameless and passwordless. You just click a button on your phone, and then you authenticate um, with whatever biometric your phone provides, and it gets you into the machine. Uh, VMs are slow, so bear in mind. Uh, so I open the Chrome browser. Generally, what people will want to see right away is they want to log into their apps. So I go to Pink Federate. This could be automatic, but for the sake of demo, you push a button that says hyperspeed and you're logged in. You're logged in with the same smart card that authenticated you to the domain in the first place. Of course, there, um, oops, there are other ways to log in. This isn't the only way to log in, but this provides the least friction for the user. You're literally doing nothing else to log in because you just authenticated yourself with, in, in a very secure way. And you can do, you don't have to be on the VPN. So it's not relying on Kerberos. The configuration is much more granular. And you can actually use this method to log into the VPN. And a lot of our customers are doing just that. Yeah, establishing that strong root of trust by securely logging into the computer and then leveraging that root of trust to then get access to downstream things without having to re-authenticate is a major time savings. Because lots of times people, when they're accessing their work resources. So at nine o'clock in the morning, they open up their laptop, they put in a password. And if they're working from home, they got to put in a password plus do a OTP or something to get on the VPN. And then they open up their browser to access a corporate application. Sometimes then they also have to <laughs> do another MFA. So before they have opened a spreadsheet or a shared document, they've typed in three passwords and done two MFAs. And that is just unacceptable like that. We should not put our users through that. Having this single push of a button and then being able to just have seamless access into the downstream things is a, a massive usability boost. And I think, you know, us as security practitioners, especially in the identity space, we, we have to put ourselves in the position of any time we add a security control, we have to take away friction from the user experience because even if the level of friction is the same, people still won't do it because they don't like change. So you actually have to make it better and increase security to get anything done. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of where we stand as a company and as a business, and and we strive for that every single day. And so it's been um, it's been a really cool journey to to see this product develop and and get this type of value to our customers. So. Very well put. I, uh, I I love the analogy, right? It's basically the fact that we have to, if we increase security controls, we're going to have to basically offset and make it better. Um, it's so true. <laughs> it's so true. Uh, there has to be a very positive trade-off to even get uh, adoption on that change. Uh, being that we're hitting that 30-minute mark uh, and we try to stay as close to, to 30 minutes as possible, uh, thank you, Pasha. Uh, Boy, it's always a pleasure to be spending time with you. And I'm looking forward to seeing both you fellas uh, at Identiverse. Uh, and for anybody who is watching, who uh, maybe watches the recording later, uh, do look for us at the show. Uh, we will be there. We're open to have conversations. Uh, it, you know, Definitely looking forward to the event. Uh, and hopefully you guys have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you, everybody, for, uh, for tuning in. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Pasha. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you.